Welcome back to the Tradition Automation Show. I'm Laval Lee from TraditionAutomation.com here with a special interview with Disney director Aaron Blaze at the Audubon Center for Birds of Prey in Central Florida. Aaron started his career in 1986 when he attended Ringling School of Art in Sarasota, Florida. Then later got hired at Disney Feature Animation and started working on Roller Coaster Rabbit. We'll find out how he got into animation and his first days at Disney leading up to his directorial debut. Aaron started giving lessons on CreatureArtTeacher.com, where he's been teaching thousands of artists how to draw, animate, and paint beautiful animals. But enough talk from me. On to the interview. Hey, Aaron, thanks hey, for coming. Thank you. <laughs> Pleasure well, to be here. Yeah, uh, a lot, what a lot of people don't know is we actually have done a couple interviews with you before, went interviews, and this is our first time on camera, so thank you. I know, you. and this is a pleasure. I'm, I'm excited, yeah. so very cool. Well, I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, when was your first aha moment? My very first aha moment in animation was, I still remember very vividly, I was just a, I was a young guy. I was uh, working under Glenn Keane at the time, mm. and uh, it was the very first time. I was an illustrator. I wasn't an animator, so I was at Disney getting trained as an animator, and it was the first time that I'd ever shot anything and I had animated this little flower sack jumping up in the air. Mm. I've never done anything like it before mm. and uh, and it was the first time that I got to see something play back and actually move across the screen and that's that, that was right when I was hooked. It was just a simple very badly animated little piece but yeah. it it just really hooked me and uh, mm. and then I just never looked back after that. Wow, wow. Yeah. Well, uh, how did you actually get your start in animation? Well, the way I got started in animation was I went to the Ring College of Art and Design in Sarasota, Florida, and I wanted to be an illustrator. I'd been drawing and painting animals my whole life, and I wanted to work for National Geographic. That was my big dream. And uh, uh, then I found out that National Geographic they didn't hire on staff illustrators at the time. They were just freelancing everything out. I had already been freelancing my, my way through school and I just didn't want to freelance anymore. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so there was two companies that were coming to the school to interview. One was Hallmark Cards mm -hmm. and the other was Disney. Mm. And so I was going to interview with both. <laughs> Disney just happened to be first. That's ex and that's exactly how I got into animation. Wow. So I put together a, uh, a portfolio of, of animal drawings and figure drawings. And it was an experiment that Disney was doing at the time. This is the very first time that they, uh, they'd ever gone outside of an animation school. They'd mm. kind of tapped out the schools with CalArts and Sheridan and all that. And so they wanted to see if they could pull talent from uh, schools that had the strong base in drawing and painting mm. and then teach them animation at Ringling. And so I was kind of that first inaugural try at doing that. Mm. And, uh, and so, like I said, Disney was first. I put together a portfolio. I thought maybe I'd be a background painter. I wasn't mm. sure. And mm. then I, and then I had my little aha moment animating <laughs> that little flower sack, and I became an animator after that. Wow. Yeah. Well, you said one of your uh, inspir or your mentor was uh, Glenn Keane. Correct. What are some valuable lessons you actually learned from Glenn? You know, I, I could go on and on and on about Glenn Keane. Glenn Keane, you know, for the people out there that know Glenn, or know of him uh, and uh, know his personality, that's exactly who he really is. He's mm. just, he's a really great, not only is he he's a great animator, he's just this really giving guy, a, a great soul. And so one of the things I got from him uh, that I tried to do as I became a leader in the studio later on, one of the biggest things was um, once I became an animator, well, first of all, Glenn just lives and breathes animation and you can't, when you're around him and you're talking about it, you can't help but be inspired and, and mm. you know, and want to do good and um but then uh, uh after after my internship he and i stayed in touch and i came he stayed in california and i came back and i worked in florida at the mgm studios and we were working on beauty and the beast mm. and so glenn asked me if i wanted to be one of the beast animators but i'd be doing it in florida mm. and so one of the things he did was he gave me i'm just i was a brand new animator i've, I've worked on rescuers down under before that but i only been animating for about a year but he he gave me this sequence, uh, this entire sequence in Beauty and the Beast where the beast is sitting in front of this fireplace and he's getting bandaged after being attacked by the wolves mm. and he and Belle get in this big argument back and forth. That's a big juicy sequence. Yeah. I, I, I think I was only 22 or 23 at the time. Wow. And, um, but he was, he knew, he knew I could do it. He knew I would struggle, mm -hmm. but he, he gave me the sequence knowing that it would elevate my game. Mm. And that's the one thing that he always did for everybody. Mm. He would he would, he'd give you something just above what you think you could do, and everybody you know all and all the ships raise. You know, I mean, yeah. it's just he he's just really giving in that way. And so we mm. tried to you know I've always tried to do that. Remember that, 
you know, whether I was a supervising animator or a director or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. tried to. The more you do that for people, the more the more ownership they take as well, and it just it elevates morale and 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 abilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you were one of the first at the MGM Studios here in Florida. Yes. Or were you the absolute number one first? Well, the, <laughs> there is a group of us that were all hired on the same day. Yeah. And we all came in on April 17th, 1989. So it was a couple of weeks before the official opening day, which was May 1st. Oh. I was actually still in college. Uh, I still had a month to go, but mm. Ringling let me leave so I could start at Disney. So oh. that was really cool. Yeah, that's cool. Um, but I was there from April 17th, 1989, when they first let us in until I can't remember exactly the closing date in 2003 hmm. but most of the almost all the artists had actually left at that point when they decided to shut the studio down hmm. but myself and my co-director Bob Walker and producer Chuck Williams we actually stayed in, in, in that building for another several months until like mid 2004 hmm. um, creating a new movie that actually never got made but we were developing a new film there so we were the first one, Bob, Bob and Chuck also started on April 17th, 1989. Huh. Wow. So we all started on the same day, day together and we were the last three to walk out of the studio. Hmm. Well, what was the first project you worked on at Disney? The very first project I worked on at Disney was uh, a short called Roller Coaster Rabbit. It was oh, a Roger I Rabbit cartoon. That that short. It was released with <laughs> Dick Tracy. Hmm. But it was interesting because, you know, the, the, the genesis of the whole, you know, their intention for that studio was to do Donald, Mickey, and Goofy shorts and featurettes. Yeah. And we never did a single one. Hmm. You know, we got in there and uh, they had just finished up Tummy Trouble and they wanted to get this other uh, uh, short done, a roller coaster rabbit, and so they sent it to us and that was our first project. Huh. And so I started out on that as a cleanup artist, as an assistant animator, and then during that process, one of our animators left and opened up a hole. Hmm. And so I, I went for that position and ended up getting promoted to an animator during that. That production. Cool. Yeah. Well, what was your first uh, directorial debut in at Disney? Well, I mean, it's the first feature I did was Brother Bear, but I yeah. did a small project before that called How to Haunt a House. So it was a little, it was a little goofy short that <laughs> actually the TV uh, division had already kind of put it together and it was ready to be made. Yeah. And so it came to us, and it was you know Disney was nice enough to let me kind of get my feet wet uh, in directing with an entire crew and everything. Hmm. And it was, uh, I think it was about six minutes. It was a short little bit and it was great. I had a re really good time. And it's still, still floating around YouTube and yep, that sort yep. of thing. You can find <laughs> it, yeah. Well, what are some of your favorite moments at Disney? Like some stories? I know everyone's got a story. Oh man, I mean, <laughs> it's, I, I've got so many great moments working, working with the artists. Um, Every day was an adventure. We always we were always playing practical jokes on each other. We always have, a, you know, we were like five year olds running around and getting paid to you know to make cartoons. We had rubber band wars all the time. <laughs> and at the time, uh, at MGM, it was a big hub for them to bring in big celebrities and stars and stuff. And so we we got to meet a lot of really interesting people on a on a day to day, week to week wow. basis. So, you know, I've I. I gave a tour to Michael Jackson and brought him through the stu studio. I, I wow. hung out for an entire day with Jimmy Carter and his whole family. And wow. John Ritter and Robin Williams and George Lucas and wow. met Princess Diana and, wow. and William and Harry. And, and um, I got, a, I got Orville Redenbacher came up to me and gave me his card and it said, I met Orville Redenbacher. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So it was, that part of it was really cool. So we got, you know, we were right in the thick of it. Um, and, 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 and it was during that, you know, that new renaissance. And so yeah. everything we did was, was, was becoming gold. And, and it was just a great way. We were a little jaded. I mean, we were, we were, a lot of us, it was our first big professional jobs. And we just, we didn't know it was any other way. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, that was the beauty. I mean, every day we came into work, it was a new adventure. And, and we worked hard. I mean, we'd, we'd go from, you know, sometimes 7 in the morning until 2 in the morning. And we'd go home for like 3 or 4 hours and then come back, you know, wow. and we'd be in a crunch. But we did it together, you know, and those are the things that I remember the most. My, my favorite moments are, you know, sitting there at one o'clock in the morning with a full studio and we're playing comedy tapes and we're laughing and we're cutting jokes because, you know, we've been at it for 12 hours and yeah. we're getting punchy, you know. And those are the things we remember the most. You know, we did that on Aladdin and Beauty and the Beast. And, and the other cool thing about the Florida studio is that it was an open, especially in the early days, yeah. it was an open plan. Yeah. So the background artists and the layout artists and the cleanup artists and the animators, we were all together in one yeah. room. 
And so uh, it, that part of it was great because we're, you know, like I said, we're yelling at each other and laughing. <laughs> and it was great. Sounds like a lot of fun. It was. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> well, how did you become the director of Brother Bear, or one of the directors? Well, I was. Uh, we were just finishing up. Uh, the way I, I became the director on that project was uh, we were just finishing up on Mulan. And uh, for the last couple of years before that, this is 1997. So the last couple of years before that, I'd been going up to Alaska for my, because, you know, even though I went to Disney and, and was an animator and all that, I still kept up my, my love of drawing and painting and painting wildlife and nature. And yeah. so I would take these trips on my own for my vacation. So I'd just gone to Alaska several times. And I'd just gotten back uh, when they had uh, a big state of the studio kind of conference where they'd video conference everybody in. And they would talk about, the heads of the studio would talk about what was in development mm. and, and what was currently being made and all that kind of stuff. Mm. So it was Tom Schumacher who was uh, running the studio at the time. Mm. And so they got to this little project that no one was working on. It was just sitting on a shelf called Bears. Mm. And so instantly when I heard that, because I love animating animals, I just, I knew I wanted to work on it. Mm. I didn't care what it was. I just wanted to be attached to it. That's awesome. And, uh, yeah. but there was, there, there was nothing to it. And so I started emailing uh, Tom Schumacher and said, you know, I'd love to let me do some character design or development or something. I just really want to work on this. And, and I just kept kept emailing him hmm. until uh, finally he contacted me back and, you know, asked me why I was so interested in it. And I talked to him and I, I brought in this giant painting of this grizzly bear that I had <laughs> done when I got back from Alaska. And I, you know, I, I said, I, it's in my head. I've got this thing in my head. And uh, and he said, well, have you ever considered directing? And that was a big, I, I hadn't considered directing at that time. And actually, up to that point, I, um, a lot of the directors that I had started with on a project would get taken off and be replaced by someone else. And so <laughs> I was like, man, I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I talked to family about it and, and just decided it was an opportunity that I couldn't pass up. And so I kind of dove in with both feet. And, and uh, knowing now what I didn't know then, it was, it was I didn't know a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... Uh, but I, yeah, I always explain it. It was my, my six-year filmmaking school. Wow. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> you said you uh, did a painting that you ended up showing him. Do you still have that painting? I do. I still have it sitting up against the wall in my studio. That's great. At home. It's framed. <laughs> it's been in different shows all over the place. It's actually in the Making of Brother Bear book. Oh, wow. Um, uh, but, yeah, it just sits in my studio up against the wall. Well, I know Disney would send a lot of the artists and directors to on location to study for different movies. Did Correct. you guys do that for Brother Bear? We did. Uh, you know, for Brother Bear, we, um, because it was domestic, we were able to do two trips. Uh, you know, we were able to keep our price, our costs down, because uh, those trips can be really expensive. I mean, they yeah. sent a whole crew for Lion King over to Africa. Wow. You know, for Beauty yeah. and the Beast, there was a whole bunch that went to France, you know. So yeah. they can get really expensive. But we, you know, Brother Bear takes place in North America, so we were able to keep our costs down. So we were able to do two trips, one for story and one for visual development. I was mm. able to go on both trips because mm. I'm... I'm involved, obviously, in story as a director, but also because of my painting background, my animation background, I did a lot of design for the film as well. Yeah. And so um, we went up to Sequoia National Park in California, up in the Sierras, and spent a lot of time there. We went over to uh, Grand Teton in Jackson, Wyoming, hmm. went up into Yellowstone, uh, spent a lot of time up there, and then we went all over Alaska. So, you know, the, the story takes place in Alaska. Yeah. And, um, and so we did a lot of research with the Athabascans and the native peoples of, of that time. Um, and actually, we pushed, the, we pushed the date of the movie way back to the Ice Age. You saw that there's mammoths in the movie and that sort yeah. of thing. So that <laughs> we could kind of create our own culture. One of the things that we did was we studied a lot of Native American myths and legends. And we kind of got the flavor for them hmm. and then decided to write our own. And so that was the, the idea behind Brother Bear. And all of that obviously takes place in Alaska. So actually, one of the coolest experiences I had was um, Tim Hodge and I, who's one of our uh, excellent story guys, uh, he actually storyboarded the entire bear hunt sequence in the beginning of the movie, and it never changed. It stayed that way all, all the way through production. <laughs> but he and I, uh, we got sent out to um, a place called McNeil River State Park. It's the highest concentration of grizzly bears in the world. Mm. And so, and there's only 10 people allowed in there a week. And so, and we had to have a, a ranger camping with us. Wow. And, uh, and we had, you know, thousand pound grizzlies walk through our campsite during the night. I had, I had one big, uh, like 1200 pound male chasing this 800 pound female when we went out to the actual salmon run and we we're sitting there and he, she caught a salmon and he wanted that fish and they came running right past, from me to you. That's how close they ran right past us. Wow. And the ranger just kept saying, don't run, don't run, don't run. <laughs> and I was just like, oh my God, I want to run so bad. 
But uh, yeah, it was just, it was amazing. It was a really cool experience. Wow, that sounds really scary. Yeah, too. it was it was scary, but <laughs> thrilling at the same time. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's fast forward a couple of years. Recently, you got to work on a commercial from John Lewis, the uh, bear in the hair. Yeah. Can you tell us how that came about? Yeah, so, um, you know, up to that point, you know, I was, I was, after I left Disney back in 2010. I came back to Florida. I wanted to be back in my home state. And there was a new studio opening up, uh, Digital Domain. They started a new animation studio. And uh, so I was doing some work for them, uh, but they, they ended up going bankrupt uh, get bankrupt after a couple of years. Yeah. And so I found myself kind of figuring out what I wanted to do next. And, um, and during that time, I got a phone call from this ad agency in London that was in charge of this commercial. And they, were, uh, they had heard about me through my connection with Brother Bear and, mm. and everything else and, and, and the animation industry. And, um, and they just asked if it was something that I would be interested in. And they pitched mm. me the, the project. And um, first of all, you know, they, they wanted realistic animals, which was right up my alley. And then I oh, yeah. heard about their process, <laughs> which was really, really unique, the way that they did this, this cartoon. A mixture of uh, hand-drawn animation and then and live action backgrounds? Yeah, it was really interesting. We did everything, uh, Dom Carolla and myself, we, um, we uh, directed the animation together. I did all of the uh, character design. And then I, I animated personally. I animated all of the bear character and the hair character. Hmm. And so we did that, did this all together, and it was all done on paper. Some of it was done on paper. Some of it was done digitally, but still hand drawn. Yeah. And what we would do is we'd send the you know the the animation, the cleaned up animation, out to the guys in London, and they would print the animation out. Well, they they'd scan it and color it mm -hmm. on in, uh, CG, uh, but then they would print it out on these thin pieces of board, and they would cut out each silhouette with a laser and then set it up in a in a real miniature set wow and just replace board after board after that's board. a lot of boards it was a lot of boards <laughs> yeah imagine. it's incredible and so it came, you ended up with this really cool effect i mean it was just it's nothing i'd ever seen before yeah and uh you know they had real shadows and and you know they they composited a few things you know, with snow and that sort of thing, but they really tried to get everything in camera. So it was yeah. it was a very cool experience. Yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful commercial. Oh, thanks. Absolutely love yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was it was one of the highlights of my career. Really, was so different and, and really cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, real recent, one of your paintings went viral all over the internet, yeah. all over the news, all over. It was, sorry. <laughs> Uh, Cecil the Lion. Yes. And uh, what do you think about that huge response you got? You know, I, I, it was it was so unexpected. You know, it, I I wanted to do something. Well, backing up from that, I, you know, I've I'm not an anti hunter. I understand hunting for sustenance and, yeah. and that sort of thing. I, I I don't like trophy hunting. I just don't. And uh, but it's not a black and white issue. I mean, there there is a lot of money that gets brought in, and and so if you take that money away, you need to find another way to bring other monies in and it's a very complex issue yeah. and I was reading a lot uh, you know the Cecil the line just like everybody else that whole issue it really brought to light you know some of the issues that they have over there because it, it actually wasn't a legal hunt this was a guy that went over there and poached and and did everything the wrong way and so I started seeing these debates going back and forth and and then all of a sudden I started seeing these really horrible things that people you know they wanted the head of the dentist and all you know it's just the human nature at its worst. Yeah. And so I decided I just wanted to create an, a, an emotional image, something that wasn't polarized, but something that where people would go, you know, that's, that is emotional, and maybe it'll make them think about trophy hunting or whatever just in a different way, but yeah. without being, you know, abusive. Yeah. And, uh, and so I, I just sat down one morning, and I just figured it would go out to my followers. You know, I've got a, I've got a fairly large following on social media. Yeah. And I like to create, you know, every morning I try to create a piece of art that I set out before I do any other work. And so I got up one morning, and, and because I worked on Lion King, uh, the painting was, it kind of popped into my head. You know, it was a no-brainer. Yeah. And, um, and my, my uh, business partner, Nick Birch, has a friend over at uh, Upworthy, a, a website, and he sent it to him. And they ended up putting it on their their other website, uh, Distractify, and it just got picked up everywhere. Yeah, and it just went crazy. Yeah. And and I think it was you know it was because it was you know it really struck that emotional chord. Lion King has always held a real special spot in people's hearts. Oh, yeah. The sequence that I was allud alluding to, where Mufasa comes into the clouds, you know, I, it's. 25 years or 20 years later and I still get teared up when I see that and I worked on the movie so <laughs> you know it was just I think everything would just align the right way yeah. 
there. Okay. Well, nowadays you're teaching, you know, up, up and coming uh, artists and animators, you know, how to actually animate and yeah. draw on creatureartteacher.com. Correct. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. You know, after after I finished up the bear and the hair, um, I decided I didn't want to go back to the big studios again. I've, I'm liking my life back in Florida. Um, I'm kind of, I'm, I was liking the life of kind of becoming the solitary artist, kind of going down the path that I want to go down. Yeah. Um, but I wasn't at a point yet where I was being able to bring in enough income that I could live on that. And so I wanted to just, I just, I thought, okay, I'm 45 years old at the time. I'm starting my life over. What do I want to do? And I thought, well, I've got this 25 years of experience that, yeah. that I could, I want, you know, I, I started thinking about Glenn, Glenn Keane. And so I thought, you know what, I could, I could get that out to people. And then the other thing, too, that, that's on a side note that's been really bothering me for a couple of years is the cost of tuition for college. Oh, yeah. It's just gone through the roof, and it's obscenely expensive. Um, to go to a great art school, or any great private school, or you know, for that matter, you know, you're talking $50,000 a year. Minimum. Minimum. Yeah. And so to have <laughs> you know, kids going into the, art, into the art industry over $100,000 in debt as a 22-year-old, yeah. I mean, that's insane to <laughs> yeah. me. And so I never, I don't think we'll ever be a replacement for college. We'll never do that. Over the years, I'm hoping to build something. But I want to be at least a, a nice, solid, supplementary place that you can go to and get training. Yeah. And now it's not going to be one-on-one, -on -one, or at least that's not in our plan right now. But I sit and I'll create. You know, so what I'm doing now is I'm creating multi-video courses on animation, animal drawing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be doing illustration, storyboarding. You know, the, basically the entire animation process, traditional drawing and painting. So over the next couple of years, we hope to build it to be basically big, you know, college course type uh, things that you can download. And the other thing that we're trying to do, so from a pricing standpoint, we price it to where everybody in the world can afford it. Yeah. And so everybody wins. Yeah. Well, how yeah. many lessons do you have total now? Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know. I've got, I've got a lot. Um, well, I've, I, the other thing I do is I create Photoshop brushes, and so oh, yeah, yeah. those those uh, there's a big demand for those, and uh, uh, so I do, I've got a lot of those on my website. My my animation course, I mean that one course alone has, I think, 20 videos in it. Uh, I just released an, a, a brand new uh, how to draw big cats course, which will be part of an ongoing series on how to draw animals, hmm. and that one big cats course has 12 videos in it. Um, so. And I've got that. I've got a lot, several, you know, how to paint this or how to paint that. So, I don't know, 10 or 15 different courses in there. <laughs> so you have yeah. a lot. I've got a lot. For yeah. everyone to learn. Good. <laughs> yeah. And it's going to grow, too. Yeah. Matter of fact, when we're done here, I'm going back and I'm starting another course. There so. you go. That's yeah. great. A question we usually ask all of our interviewees is, uh -huh. what is it about traditional animation that is special to you? Right. You know, I've got that question a lot. And to me, it's that... It's that tactile, hand-drawn, made from, made from your hands thing, feel. Uh, I don't know how to explain it better than that. <laughs> it's so, it's just that. It's, you know, it's like a Rolls Royce. It's, you know, it's handmade. And, um, and, not, and I, I like, there's a lot of CG that I love. Don't get me wrong. But there's something about, you know, getting in there and taking a stack of paper and a pencil and you create something that makes people laugh and cry. and I mean, it's magic. Yeah. It, it, it's absolutely magic what you're able to do. I mean, it's nothing short of that. I mean, you, you literally, you flip through that, and all of a sudden there's life in this stack of paper that just came out of your head. Yeah. <laughs> so anything you can think of, you can instantly have come down through your hand and put it on the paper, and the only thing limiting you is your imagination. Yeah. And, and I like the speed of it. You know, I just, I like being able to sit down and go, hey, I've got an idea for something, I want to animate it. Yeah. And I can do it in a couple days, and it's done. I don't have to go and rig it, I don't have to model it, I don't have to you know, do all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and so it's just, I like the instant gratification of it, I love the artistry of it more than anything else. Um, and like I said, it's just, it's absolute magic. All right. Well, thank you for coming. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> You're all willing to do a small animation lesson for our viewers of uh, Paige here? I think I'd like to animate a bald eagle flying. So yeah, yeah. Let's try to do that. All right, great. Let's try it. All right, cool. All right, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, everybody. So um, it was really great to do the interview. We were out at the Audubon Bird Center, uh, Birds of Prey Center, 
And so I thought, you know, you know, one of my specialties is animal mechanics. And since we were at the Bird of Prey Center, I thought I would take you guys through the mechanics of an actual eagle flying. Now, one of the things that really gets under my skin is seeing people that animate birds and, and they don't do their proper research. And so a bird is not merely, you know, wings going down and then coming back up again. There's actually, there's, there's mechanics to it that actually the, the physics that, get, that give the, the bird flight. Okay, so the first thing I want to show you is just a little bit of comparative anatomy. And that is, here I've sketched out a human arm real quick, you can see. And then right next to it, I want to show you how that kind of compares. A bird's wing, if I draw the bird's body here, you know, they have the shoulder blade just like we do here. The upper part of their arm comes down just like here, and then it comes up, and then we've got, so you've got the bones here, just like you've got bones that come through on the, on the arm here and into the wrist. You've got the same thing happening here. There's a wrist there, all the little bones of the wrist, and then a couple of finger bones that come out like so on a bird's wing, just like that. And then you've got the same kind of shape. Now you've got some skin that comes in like so. And so you end up with this kind of, and then the thumb is up here. And so you, and yeah, they actually have a little thumb bone up there. And so if you add the feathers to this, then you get a group that comes out like so. And then it comes back and that's your bird wing. So you can see that their arm is just like our arm. The comparative anatomy is actually very interesting. And usually with these big birds like this, you'll have the section here are called the primaries, and then these, these are your secondaries in here. Okay? And that wing, if you look at it from the edge, you know, you've got the, if the arm is coming straight at you like so, that wing is shaped just like an airplane wing. So that you actually, as the air flows over that wing, like so, you have high pressure on top, or low, a high pressure underneath, low pressure on top, and you get lift. And that's how, just like a regular airplane flies, it's the same thing with a bird, okay? So, and these, these feathers will radiate out, radiate out like so. Now, one other thing to, to note, and this is kind of detail-y, but I still think it's important. A bird's wing, we're, imagine that we're looking down on top of this bird. And so the feathers will actually overlap each other the leading edge will overlap the feather in front of it. And that's because as the wings come down, they stay stiff. But as they come back up, the way that they're oriented, the air can flow through them and create less drag. And then when the, bear, the bird wants to take another uh, downbeat, then they come together again and they can push the air out, scoop it, and they get lift. So I thought, why don't we go ahead, so I've, there's your comparative anatomy. Why don't we go ahead and, um, and I'll just show you uh, some mechanics. So I, I went ahead very, very quickly, and I roughed out a couple of, uh, a few drawings showing mechanics of this bird flight. And so what I'd like to do is just kind of walk through it with you. And we'll just, uh, I'll show you how a bird flies, how a, how a bald eagle flies. Now keep in mind, a lot of, you know, the smaller birds, the mechanics are basically the same. The physics are the same. It's just that the timing will be different. The, the proportions will be different, that sort of thing. But here, you know, because we had that beautiful bald eagle behind us, I uh, thought it might be kind of fun to show you this bald eagle. And so here you can see I've created this, this flight. And so I'm starting with that, the upbeat. And if you look at where the wings are, of where the feathers are, you can see that I've, I'm starting to, that they're starting to scoop the air. It's starting this, this downbeat. And so you can see there's the elbow right up into the wrist. Thumb is right there. And then as this wing starts to come down, it's going to scoop this air. And so you're going to see these feathers really start to billow out. And so as I, as I uh, bring this through, you can really start to see it in here. And the other thing too is you're going to see these feathers, everything's going to drag. You see that drag? It starts to really, that air is really pushing against these feathers. And as the bird, you know, they have very, very strong 
chest muscles, pectoralis muscles that connect into the wings. And that's what powers these big wing beats coming down. Okay? So that by the time we get into here, you can see these feathers are really scooping that air and dragging. And notice also, I'm really paying attention to that arc. I'm going to do a drawing in between here. And as I draw, here I'm just, I'm starting with the body. And as I draw, I'm thinking about, okay, that wing's got to come down and it's really got to scoop that air. You know, this is the downbeat. This is where the bird gets its power. You know, as, a, as that wing beat, as the wings come down, they're scooping that air and really pushing the bird through and holding him up through the air. And so I draw these really big chest muscles coming down. And then as these, as this wing comes down, and come up into the wrist, here's the elbow in here, up into the wrist. And then those feathers really, really drag. And we're going to see this wing really scoop the air. See that? It scoops the air. And I stay very loose. At this stage, I'm really, all I'm worried about is that action. I want to get that action down. I don't want to get too tied up in details. So here, once again, I'm thinking about this arc coming around. So I want to make sure that that wing beat is right in there and I want to get that nice drag so it's all arcing towards the top of where the wing beat came from. And once again, I'm scooping. See how these, these feathers are really scooping that air as it comes down through that, that bottom beat. And I'm just going to roughly indicate some feathers right there. So that when I throw this drawing back in between, we can start to feel that scooping of the air. And it comes back around. Now, you can see here, as, that, as this wing beat comes down, he's really pumping that air, you'll notice now as he gets to the bottom, his wings, his arms come down, I, I say arms, so, you know, we're like this. As the arms come down, they got to, he's got to bring those wing beats back, back, back up. But he doesn't, we don't want the drag of the air pushing against the feathers. You want the drag coming down, but you don't want the drag going back up. So when they bring their wings back up, they're doing it in the, in the path of least resistance so that the air will just flow through the wing and over the wing. So you'll notice as the wings come down, we're really scooping a lot. But as the wings come back up, you'll see that they bend their arms, bend their wings, I should say. And as it comes up, these feathers, the primary feathers, will separate and the air can pass through them. And once again, he's bending his elbows right here, and here's the wrist. Wrist and elbows. He's coming down. And then coming up like this, just like on our arms, coming up like this, and then extending and, and pumping back down again. So, I'm going to do a little in-between drawing in here. So once again, I'm going to get this body drawn in. And thinking about, once again, knowing that these wings are coming down and they need to start coming back up in a way that the air will flow over them and through them and not cause any drag. So here I want, I'm thinking about this arc again, coming in, coming in. And still bending those feathers just a little bit. And the same here. Here's an elbow in here with the wrist. And those feathers bending up and scooping, scooping the air. Just like so. Really scooping it. And 
I'll just scribble through this very quickly. Come up here. Actually, I want that to scoop this way. There we go. So that when I bring this in, you can see that, that those wings are really scooping the air. Now we're going to go back up into the upbeat. So if I were to draw this from the front, if, I were to, if we just did a little circle, imagine the bird coming right at you like so. And let's start with the upbeat. That's where the upbeat would be. And as the wing, as he brings his wings down, they come down like so, down like so. And then they come in and bend in like this. And then on the upbeat, they bend in like this. And then they come back up like this. So that you get a much bigger down sweep and then almost like an S coming back up again. Okay, just want you to remember that. And that is a proper wing beat for a bird flying. So I'm gonna throw an in between in here. Once again, we have, you know, I'm thinking about you know, I want to keep that the head and, and body, they stay fairly, fairly still. But there's a little bit of up and down to the body. As the wings come down, as they're pumping air, you're going to feel the body come up. There's a little bit of overlap there. And then as the wings come up, the body will come back down. And so you get this kind of mo motion to the, uh, to the body. So those are the physics that I think about as I'm thinking about this bird animation. One of the things that I've always explained to people that really don't understand animation is that animation is very much an analytical process. So on one hand, you're, you're expressing yourself artistically, but on the other, you're thinking about things from a very analytical uh, uh, viewpoint. And so it becomes a very left and right brain process. Um, you really got to think about physics, I'm going to get that elbow bent right behind his head here. Once again, that arm is coming up. I keep calling it his arm because I always just think of it like my arm. And these feathers are coming down. This is where they start to drag. Like so. I'm going to do the same thing in here. in there. Those feathers start to come back around. You see how the he gets less, as, as the wing beats come up, as the, as the upstroke happens, then you're getting, there's, he's has got less of a profile so that the air, there's not as much drag happening. So a lot of people didn't realize there's so much mechanics going into a and to a bird flying. A lot of them, like I said, will just do these beats going up and down, but it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, one of the things we want to do in animation is we want to, we want to enhance life, what happens in real life. And one of the things to, to give that illusion, to create that illusion for the viewer is to make sure that you have good physics in your animation. So you're always having to observe, always, you know, look at the world around you and, you know, be interested in how things work. And think about physics, think about weight, think about, you know, airflow like we're doing here. All these things you take into your brain and, and through observation and practice, you can get it into your animation and it makes your animation that much stronger. So here you can see the, the wings are starting to come up and those feathers are really spreading apart as they come up because of the way that they're laid out, the, the upbeat separates the feathers so that the airflow can go right through the wing. So there's no resistance. So that upbeat has no resistance as it goes up. And then when, when the wing comes back up and it changes direction, then all of a sudden the feathers are pressed against each other and it creates that heavy drag where they can scoop the air and go for that next wing beat. So here, you can see as this wing, as this wing beat comes up, the arms are bending, the wrists are bending, and then we're going, and then he straightens it right out. So that I'm going to grab the first drawing, because this is a cycle. This loops right into the first drawing. I'll turn this around. 
like so. So you can see it gets ready to start doing that. that. This is the drawing we started with. So that wing comes up and we're getting ready for that next beat. And you can even see, I don't know if you can see on camera, there's a slight down push down to the body. And then he gets ready for that next big scoop of air. I'm going to throw an in-between right into here because it feels like it could use it. We'll just throw one more in-between in. As those wings come up, thinking about the elbows right here, elbows in here, up into the wrist. And, that, and what's happening is here he's bringing that, those arms up and he's going basically from here and just bringing, that's all he's doing, he's just bringing his wrists up just like I'm doing here. Those feathers are dragging. Dragging feathers here. And once again, like I said, I keep things very loose at this stage. So I'm just worried about getting that action. Because you can always go back in once you get that action down, is, you know, this is, so one thing I tell students all the time is don't, don't get too tight too fast because you're going to, you might find that you do all that work doing all this tight drawing and then all of a sudden you find out that the animation, the most important part, doesn't actually work. So what I try to do is I do it very, very loose first and make sure that, so I'm not wasting a lot of time. I'm just getting it down quick. I'm really figuring out that action. Then once the action or the acting or the dialogue or whatever it is that you might be doing, for that animation, once that's roughed in, then you can go, okay, I'm gonna sit down today and now I'm gonna redraw everything and I'm gonna do it very nice and neat. That's called tying down your scene. So now you can see, we've got that wing coming up. He's flipping his wrist, flipping his wrist and getting ready for that next, that next downbeat. So, what we end up with, I'm going to pull these right off the pegs. I'm not sure if we can flip this. But what we end up with is this really cool bird flying. And we get this great cycle happening. And you can see, scooping, scooping that, well, the wings are coming up. And then he's scooping that air as it comes down. And then the wings come back up, no resistance and then pumping that air. And so that's a bird flight. So once again, I wanna thank Lavelle and all the people at Traditional Animation for bringing me on. I've really had such a great time. Uh, I hope you guys learned something. It's, it's been wonderful sharing with you and I'll talk to you later, thanks. Well, there you have it. Thank you again for watching the Traditional Animation Show. Remember, if you plan on learning hand-drawn animation, make sure you learn from a professional. There are a lot of people out there trying to teach animation the wrong way, which will only give you bad habits. I also want to give a big thank you to the Audubon Center for Birds of Prey for letting us use their center, which rescues and rehabilitates raptors, like Paige the bald eagle in our show. Once again, comment, Share and let us know your animated thoughts. Until next time, I'm Lavelle Lee from traditionalanimation.com.